All right. Uh, so welcome, everybody. Hopefully you're in the right place. We've added an extra zero to all of the course numbers this year. So this is now CIS 7000. Um, and I know some of you, but not all of you. So I thought maybe a good way to start a class uh, would be to just like go around and give some quick introductions. I'll start. Uh, so my name's Aaron Roth. I'm a professor in the computer science department interested in a bunch of things these days, uh, machine learning and fairness and uncertainty quantification, which is what I'm going to spend many hours talking to you about this semester. Um, but uh, who are you guys? Maybe we can just start uh, start in the front here and, and go through. So maybe for each of you, like a, a name and, um, you know, I don't know, a degree that you're enrolled in getting, hoping to get eventually, and um, interest, research interests. Hi, everyone. I'm a second year master's student at Data Science. And my name is Juba. And my interest. I, I think uh, on the this way, I have a lot of, lot of uh, interest in this class. So I did an internship uh, this summer in trades and data science based on my focus on the trades on the Nakamura system. So and kind of the motivation for me to take this course uh, and uh, the uncertainty estimation. But there is uh, a lot of kind of uncertainty involved in the this uh, representation. So yeah, that's why I think. Cool. So maybe we'll just move across the front row. Sure. Um, my name is Jody. Uh, I'm a third year PhD student in uh, computer science. Um, my research interest is in, on a broader field is crosswords in machine learning. I want to provide some guarantee for machine learning systems. Uh, I'm currently interested in like uncertainty quantification, especially in the online setting. Cool. Uh, hi, I'm Lauren. I'm, I'm also a uh, PhD student in computer science. Uh, I was working on the last one for last week, and uh, currently I'm planning to move my uh, move my research into the like, system uh, uncertainty quantification, like predict, uh, like predict. Cool, Natalie. Uh, that is my name. Very well done. <laughs> um, I'm Natalie. Uh, uh, and my advisor. Uh, I'm a PhD student and second year in computer science. Um, I'm interested in game theory. I'm interested in online algorithms. Yeah. Hi, I'm Behrad. I'm a second year PSE PhD student. I work with Ahmed Hassani on like theoretical machine learning, bandits, adversarial robustness, and this one. Ashwar. Hi, I'm Ishwar. I'm a fourth year PhD student. Uh, I'm interested in algorithms, game theory, online learning. Maybe we'll just snake through. I'm Hassan. Uh -huh. uh, hello, everyone. My name is Noah Fong. If I look at the time the timer, if my attention is not hard to pronounce, uh, I'm a third year student at Hal Math in Boston. So I, I'm also with Kamer Hassani and uh, Erica Dobrizan. Yeah, I work in Colonial Related Province, uh, including a special constitution and habitation style. Mm -hmm. Cool. I'm in the Econ PhD, second year, interested in econometrics and empirical IO. Awesome. I'm Abhinandan, but I go by Abhi. I am a second year PhD student in statistics and causes inference. But I'm also in statistics. Cool. Um, I'm Sarah. I'm a third year PhD student in biostatistics. Um, I'm working with Dr. Jimbo Chen, and I'm interested in um, clinical risk prediction algorithms. So, uncertainty um, estimation and algorithm is um, very important for that. Mm -hmm. So, I'm Leonardo or Leo. I'm a third year PhD in applied math. 
and I generally work with uh, uh, scientific machine learning, uh, uh, so applications of machine learning to scientific computing data. Mm -hmm. um, and this sounds like a relevant thing to that. Uh, uh, my name is Guilherme. I work uh, with uh, Dean Knox at OIG Wharton. Uh, recent, uh, I studied basically causality, basically doing research on partial multiplication uh, in different settings. Mm -hmm. uh, I work more with like, identification, but I want to go on to these last two. Cool. Hello, everyone. My name is Matthew. I'm a second year PhD in Lima. I'm interested in financial markets, asset pricing, and macro finance. Cool. Um, um, I'm second year management. We are doing projects on taking the competition and improving projects and having bad influence. So hopefully this helps me. Yes. <laughs> I'm Enrique. I'm a fourth year um, marketing PhD student. Um, I work on optimal targeting algorithms and I use a lot of variational bays, which is a terrible at uncertainty. Hopefully this helps. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Sean. I'm a third year PhD student at New. Uh, similar to you, I work on scientific machine learning. So I'm huh? focusing on more about certain points and how we can actually track them. Cool. Hi, I'm a uh, third year undergrad of computer science at Wisconsin, and I'm studying computer engineering with Mm-hmm. I'm also a senior and Again, I'm a fourth year and uh, I'm working on machine learning methods for Great. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm also a fourth year and PhD student. And I'm interested in an official model of a public fluid system and how it is from uh, is the object of the computation to all of that, the distribution, the spatial and local control distribution. Hi, I'm Brian. I'm also a third year undergrad studying stats and math. I started off being interested in econometrics and macro, but I'm moving more towards theoretical statistics and machine learning. Much more interesting than what you were studying before. <laughs> Hi, my name is Nate. I'm a second year e computation student. My interest is in macroeconomics and solving them. Uh, hi, my name is Paula. I'm a second year robotics master. Uh, my research, uh, current research includes uh, food deliveries and field supplies. Oh. I'm Rakesh Vora. I'm a perpetual student in ESC <laughs> and economics. <laughs> and I'm here because I collaborate with Aaron and I need to keep up. <laughs> I'm, I'm teaching many of Ricky's results. So. <laughs> I am already doing the data science program. I'm already boosting the theory of 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 the theory
Um, but okay, but let's start with the slide deck, which is sort of like the you know rah 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 version of the course. Like, what, what are we what are we even studying here? Oh, and by the way, like this is more fun if it's participatory, right? This is like a PhD seminar, no rules. So, like, if anything I say either makes no sense or like inspires the thought, just like shout it out. Um, so I want to like ask the basic question, you know, basically for the whole semester. Uh, what like like what should uncertainty estimates even mean, right? Like before we start to think about um, how do we compute them, what, like what what are they even supposed to mean, right? So, so maybe we'll we can make that concrete. You know, suppose there was a pandemic or something, and we've got uh, people coming into the hospital, and we've got to marshal scarce medical resources like ICU rooms or something, and so we need to like answer. Um, prediction problems, statistical estimation problems like the following, you know, given your features X, uh, you know, maybe the, the contents of your, of your medical chart, um, you know, maybe we've got like a, a model that claims to predict what your blood oxygen level is going to be tomorrow in 24 hours, maybe it predicts a number F of X, and if it looks like your blood oxygen level is going to be very low, maybe we admit you to the ER, otherwise we don't. And so we're, we're not just making predictions, we're taking actions as a, a function of these predictions. And so you might reason, you know, if you're the doctor or the patient, you might reasonably want to know how good these predictions are, right? So, so you know, our patient might ask the doctor, you know, how sure are you of this? And we can think about even like, what is the form of the answer that such a question would have, right? Like if we were asking, um, you know, how sure are you that it's going to rain tomorrow, which is something we'll think about a lot. Uh, you know, the kind of sentence, like syntactically, that maybe someone would utter to answer this question is like, well, you know, I'm 82% sure it's going to rain tomorrow. Now here, you know, the, the prediction's a number, you know, like a blood oxygen level or something. So probably we don't have much confidence that it's going to be like exactly whatever we predicted. So maybe it makes more sense to answer with like an interval, a prediction interval, right? So maybe, you know, like the, the, synta the, the, like the syntax of the sentence that um, you know, the doctor might utter is, is to give a prediction interval. I've got a 95% prediction interval that your blood interval, that your blood oxygen level will be, you know, in some range between some lower bound and some upper bound. Okay, so that's like the sentence the doctor can utter, but then the question is, what is this supposed to mean? What does this mean? In particular, how does it affect the decision making that the patient and the doctor might like, you know, uh, might, under, might undergo at the next step? And so if you're the patient or the doctor who cares about this patient, then maybe you are sort of hoping that this prediction interval has the following semantics, that somehow, you know, what we've done is we've you know, with our complete knowledge of the world conditioned on everything we know about the patient, the whole feature vector, you know, the, the everything in the medical record of the patient. Um, and that we could then say that the probability that the patient's label, their blood oxygen level tomorrow, falls within the interval is 95%, conditional on everything. And so here, you know, like, we have to think for a moment, like, what is the randomness over in this probability statement? Well, if, you know, there's, there's only one of you. So like if we've conditioned on everything we know about you, then maybe somehow the randomness is over the unrealized or unmeasured randomness of the world, you know, like there's, God has more coins to flip. And if this is what these uh, uncertainty estimates meant, if this, if this was the semantics that these prediction intervals had, then you could really use this as, um, you know, a way to inform your decision making, right? The, the prediction interval would speak to you as an individual, or at least, you know, as much, uh, you know, as much of you as is pinned down in your recorded features, right? It would be like a statement that was specific about you that you could use to think about, you know, your future decision making. Okay, but for reasons that we will interrogate in a minute, like that's not what the, that's not what this is going to mean, right? Like, you, you know, if it means anything at all, um, you know, much more commonly, what it will mean is that the prediction intervals that we give systematically over the whole population have what are called marginal coverage guarantees. So if you've ever heard of conformal prediction, for example, which is a way of attaching prediction intervals to arbitrary black box predictions, the kind of thing they give is, is a marginal coverage guarantee. 
And syntactically, right, like this expression kind of looks like this expression, but there's a, you know, semantically there's a big difference, which is that up here, we're fixing everything we know about you. We're fixing, you know, your medical record, everything else we've recorded about you, we're conditioning on it. And the randomness is only over your label, right? That's why it's like the randomness over the like unrealized or unmeasured randomness of the world. Down here, the randomness is over the person too. It's over the feature vector X. And so this is really an average over people, right? This is speaking to an individual. This is saying for 95% of people for whom we make predictions, we cover their label. Um, and for the remaining 5% of people, we don't. Okay, so that's a, quite a different thing, right? Like here, we're talking about the probability that some particular person's label will fall within this set that we've predicted. Here, we're averaging over people and asking what proportion of people have their label fall within the interval that we predicted for that person. Okay, so, so let's like think about why that might be an interesting or disturbing difference. You know, like, like what's wrong with marginal guarantees? Like maybe we should be happy with them. So uh, here we are, you know, back in our in our doctor's office, and and the doctor has just said, well, you know, here's a 95% prediction interval. Uh, it's a marginal prediction interval. And so, for example, um, you know, our patient might think to herself, well, you know, I'm part of a demographic group that represents less than five percent of the population, and this might be concerning because, like, consistent with the promise of a 95% prediction interval, is that. Um, not only might the prediction be wrong for this particular patient, it might systematically be wrong for everyone in her demographic group. Like maybe the model has learned to be sort of overconfident on part of the data space, um, and sort of, or, or you know, has learned a prediction that is sort of more accurate than it, th than it thinks on some part of the data space, and is less accurate than it thinks on a different part of the data space. And, you know, a marginal prediction interval or marginal guarantees of any sort, and if you know what calibration is, that's another marginal guarantee. Um, it just won't expose things like that, right? But like it's it's talking about success on average over what might be a large and heterogeneous population. And so in particular, like if you're part of a small population, this really might be telling you nothing about you, right? There might be something medically relevant about your demographic group that our model has failed to pick up on and um you know like still we could give you 95 percent marginal prediction interval so it'd be just paper over the problem is that clear okay now you know maybe we maybe our patient like realizes that right like you know like we do studies not just on large heterogeneous populations, we can do, you know, trials on on uh, different subsets of the population, right? So maybe our patient can ask, well, okay, well, what about for people like me? And the doctor could, you know, take down from her shelf the most recent uh, copy of you know, the most recent issue of the New England Journal of Medicine or something, and then flip through it and find the relevant articles and, and maybe say, okay, well. You know, for African Americans under the age of 50, the 95% prediction interval is from A to B. But then she could keep flipping and she could say, well, for women with a family history of diabetes, the 95% prediction interval is from C to D. She could keep flipping and she could say, well, for people with egg allergies and no history of smoking, the 95% prediction interval is from E to F. All of these could be true. And our patient might be in all of these demographic groups, right? These are not mutually exclusive. These might all describe our patient. And so uh, what, what is our patient to make of, of these prediction intervals? Like in particular, again, consistent with the promise of a 95% prediction interval um, is the event that like this correct marginal prediction interval up here, A to B, is entirely disjoint from this correct marginal prediction interval down here from E to F, right? So it's like, of course, we can like marginalize separately on different groups, but that doesn't solve the problem, right? Like, because our patient might be a member of all of these groups and you know what's she supposed to do with this okay does that make sense okay so so so, so like one of the goals in this class is going to be to come up with answers um 
that maybe are a little closer to satisfying our patient here. Okay, now the problem goes a little bit deeper. Um, I wanna think now just sort of for a moment about uh, individual probabilities, which comes up in the philosophy of statistics. This is something that Alex pointed me towards, right? So in the practice of machine learning and statistics, we predict individual probabilities like as a matter of course, all the time. You know, what are individual probabilities? These are probabilities of events that will only be realized once. So for example, in weather forecasting, you know, we will every day predict the probability that it will rain tomorrow, but tomorrow only happens one time. You know, uh, in life insurance, you know, when we are figuring out what rate to give you, um, you know, we predict things like the probability that Alice will die in the next 12 months, but Alice has but one life to live. This is going to like happen or not. It's not something we can, we can sort of repeat and average over. Um, in, in recidivism prediction, in a number of states, including uh, Pennsylvania, you know, when, when people are up for parole, there are models that try to predict the probability that they will be arrested for a violent crime 18 months after they're released. Again, they, they will or they won't. So like this is a particular individual, right? Like you can try to come up with statistical estimates, but like, you know, when we're thinking about what they mean, we have to remember that this is an event that will happen once or not. Right, in predictive medicine, we predict things like the probability that Carol will develop breast cancer before the age of 50, right? Only happens once. These are important things. Um, we predict them all the time. Um, what do they mean? Okay, so let's think about that. And even if we commit to a model of the world, which we might reasonably do, right? For example, we might model the world with a, as a probability distribution. Of course, you can always quibble with the modeling choices, but this is like you know a common and I think reasonable way to model things, right? Um, you know, if, right? So, so if we if we model the world with a probability distribution then at least we can say specifically what we mean by an individual probability, right? So, you know, we're gonna have a probability distribution. What's the distribution over? Well, it's over feature outcome pairs. So like X is like the set of all observations we might make describing, you know, the meteorological conditions, you know, today when we're predicting the weather or the medical record of Carol and everything else we care to re record about her, basically everything we have at our disposal for prediction, right? Y records the binary outcome in this case that we're trying to predict. Okay, we might imagine that, um, you know, as is common in statistics and machine learning, that we sort of think of the data that we have before us, these events that keep happening over and over again as draws from this distribution. And, you know, once we, once we commit to this modeling assumption, an individual probability means something very clear, right? It's the, you know, the, the probability that, um, you know, Alice will die in the next 12 months. If X is everything we know about Alice is just, uh, the conditional probability under this distribution we've decided to take to model the world of the probability that the label is one, that she dies within the next 12 months, conditional on X, right? Like that's, that's, what, that's mathematically what we mean when we talk about an individual probability. And let me just note that modeling things with a distribution is, is I think a pretty mild assumption. We don't have to, it doesn't mean that we are assuming the world is stochastic, right? Like this modeling choice is consistent with the possibility that individual probabilities are all zero or one. That if only we were clever enough and we stared at the information that was available enough for, you know, to us for long enough, that we could actually like, you know, decode the world, figure out deterministically what was going to happen. Okay, we're not committing to that not being the case when we commit to model the world with a probability distribution. Okay, so individual probabilities are at least something that we can like think about, right? They're like defined. But there's like a big problem if we wanna figure out what they are um, that I'll call like the measurement problem. And it's that we observe each individual at most run once, right? Like we, 
you know, like we woke up today and we saw whether it was raining or, or whether it wasn't, you know, if we're predicting the chance that Alice is going to die in the next 12 months, okay, we can wait 12 months and we'll see, like, did she die or not? But um, we're not going to get to see more than one sample. Even worse, the people we want to make predictions about, we've seen zero samples, right? It hasn't happened yet. Okay, so, so like the problem is, you know, normally if we want to like estimate in some rigorous way, like a conditional probability, we'll take a bunch of samples from the distribution under that conditioning event, we'll average them out, we'll get a good empirical estimate for what this probability is. But here, when we're talking about events that happen at most once, we can't do that, right? Sort of, you know, essentially the only thing we can do is we can uh, measure averages over sufficiently large sets, right? We can, we can pick conditioning events that are large enough that we will see many samples from them. And then we can measure from data what is the average proportion of labels that are one given that the individual that we're thinking about falls into this set that we fixed, falls into this conditioning event. We can measure these uh, sort of averages over sets, and the more data we have, the smaller the sets we can accurately measure these things for from data, but we can never get down to the individual probabilities. That's like the basic problem here. And so, you know, what are we to make of individual probabilities? Let me point out something, which is that like they're really like not determined from data. Like if our goal is to like just figure out what they are, then we're out of luck, right? Like, you know, uh, okay, I, I'm not a meteorologist. So uh, I imagine that, that they're not just guessing, but imagine you woke up on like a, like a, a totally alien world. Um, you don't know anything about the meteorology on this world. And from your perspective, you know, you wake up and like, you know, it seems like half the time it's like raining, half the time it's not raining, but you know, you've tried and you've tried and like, you just can't figure out what's going on. Like, you, you know, you've, you've collected lots of meteorological data. You don't know what's going on. Okay. So, um, so weather prediction problem, you might have a really rich feature space, right? Like maybe you've got weather balloons all over this planet, satellites, whatever you want. And then every day you learn like, you know, raining or not raining, right? A binary label. So here are two models that sort of equally well describe your observations as far as you're concerned. It might be that the individual probability of rain every day, oh, and by the way, I'm assuming that this feature space is rich enough so that you never see the same set of observations twice. Everything really is distinct. And of course, if you're taking enough measurements, then that's definitely going to be true, right? So it might be that, you know, what's going on under the hood is really the world is like stochastic and you know, like for every day, like independently of the features, even once you condition on the features, like whether it rains that day is a coin flip. The individual probabilities are one half. What you would observe if that was the case is that a uniformly random subset of the days, you know, would, would, you'd find it to be raining. Or it could be that there's some pattern, um, maybe rain is sort of uniquely determined from the features, but like you haven't figured it out. Right. It, it might be that what happened is that sort of, um, you know, before you arrived here, like God flipped a bunch of coins and determined, you know, he, he sort of partitioned the feature space, right? For every feature in the domain of this distribution, you know, God flipped a coin and partitioned them into the sort of reigning set and the non reigning set. Okay. This is like not a learnable function, this like random function. There's no hope that you can learn it. Uh, but like under this model, um, you know, like for half of the days, for any day that falls into some, you know, randomly chosen subset chosen before time began, the probability of rain given that X is in that subset is actually one. And the probability of rain given that X is in that, X is not in that subset is actually zero. Right, so I can write down two different distributions in which the individual probabilities are as far apart as they could, could possibly be, right? Like in the one case, they're integers, they're, you know, zero or one, the world is deterministic. In the other case, um, the world is randomized, that all of the individual probabilities are one half, and, but, but like they both induce the same distribution on observation. So there's no way to distinguish these two things, right? And, you know, like this is, 
consistent with what we talked about here. Like we can't measure the individual probabilities. We can measure the average outcome over sufficiently large subsets, but the average outcome is going to be about one half, no matter what we do. Okay. So, um, okay. So the point is that as we calibrate what our goals are in this class and trying to figure out, you know, how to quantify uncertainty, like one goal you might have thought was attractive is we should just like learn what these individual probabilities are and we should state things in those terms. Uh, but like that's not achievable for sort of simple reasons. Like they're just not uniquely determined from data. You can't learn the individual probabilities. Okay. And uh, while I'm talking about individual probabilities, it's hard for me to resist like telling you briefly about the reference class problem, which is the the word that sort of philosophers of statistics use when they talk about these issues. And when you read about the reference class problem, um, you know, inevitably you read about this court case, uh, United States versus Shinobi. So let me walk you through it. So Charles Shinobi was a 34 year old Nigerian citizen living in New Jersey. He worked as a toll booth operator and he was caught at JFK with 103 balloons filled with heroin in his digestive tract. And um, it was believed he had, before he was caught, made eight other drug smuggling trips based on you know, his, his entry and exit records attached to his passport, uh, but he wasn't caught for those. Now he was convicted um, and the sentencing guidelines required the court to estimate the total, qual the total quantity of heroin smuggled across all of these trips. Okay, not just the one he was caught for. Okay, so how do you do that? Well, the government employed a statistician and what he did is he produced an estimate by collecting data from all Nigerian drug smugglers who were apprehended at JFK in between the dates of the first and the last trip that Charles Shinobi was known to have taken and basically figured out on average how much you know drugs per smuggling operation these you know this this class of people tend to carry and that was their that was their estimate for Charles Shinobi. So here like Nigerian drug smugglers apprehended at JFK this is a this is what what would be called a reference class right we have to we, we're, like we're really interested in estimating a quantity that's particular to this person we don't have access to that. And so, you know, as we discussed, like what we can do is we can, we can estimate the average over uh, sufficiently large sets. This was the set that the, um, you know, the, the government statistician decided to average over to estimate Charles Shinobi's uh, uh, quantity of drugs smuggled. But as the defense pointed out, like this wasn't the only reference class they could have chosen, right? Like, um, why was it relevant that um, he was apprehended at JFK? Uh, you know, we could have looked at drug smugglers apprehended anywhere. Why was it relevant that he was Nigerian? Uh, so we could have conditioned on less stuff. We could have conditioned on more stuff or different stuff. Like maybe the fact that he was Nigerian wasn't the relevant thing. Maybe it was that he lived in New Jersey. Maybe we should have looked at drug smugglers living in New Jersey apprehended at JFK. Maybe none of that was relevant. Maybe we should have conditioned only on the fact that he was a toll booth operator and looked at what was the average you know, number of drugs smuggled uh, you know, by toll booth operators in that, in that time period. Um, I don't know if number of drugs is, I don't know how drugs are quantified, but. Maybe those apprehended and those not apprehended. <laughs> possible we, well we, you know that's another problem this is a censored observation setting we can only look at the we can only look at people who are apprehended um and the basic point is that you know look this guy is a member of every single one of these reference classes so you know we could have tried to estimate this quantity using any one of these reference classes um each would have given a different number so so what is it that like privileges one of these um estimates over another. That's sort of what, what um, philosophers of science worry about when they talk about the reference class problem. This is closely related to something that computer scientists have started worrying about in the fairness and machine learning literature uh, called the model multiplicity problem. Okay, so when we sit down and train some statistical or machine learning model, um, 
to predict probabilities, we're really committing to a model of individual probabilities, right? Like we're actually like, you know, proposing a particular model that takes as input the features of a particular person and outputs like a probability between zero and one. We're committing to some model of individual probabilities, even though of course we can't be sure about any particular one. Right, so if you've ever run a logistic regression or more sophisticated method, that's what you're doing. Okay, but um, since we can't observe these individual probabilities, you know, say you've got your model, I've got mine, how do we adjudicate between them? How do we, how do we, you know, they make different predictions uh, on different people, how do we know which one's right? And so one thing we could do is we could check that our models are consistent with various reference classes. We can measure things, and we can't measure individual probabilities, but we can measure things on average over sufficiently large sets. Maybe we measure the average outcome over a bunch of sufficiently large sets, okay? And, and just check for consistency. We can try to falsify the model. And if you know what calibration is, that's an attempt at passing a particular class of statistical tests, trying to sort of falsify the model and failing to falsify the model with respect to a particular set of statistical tests. And if you don't know what calibration is, you'll, you shortly will, we're gonna tell you. Uh, and if you do know what it is, there's a strengthening of it that you might not have heard of called multi-calibration um, that I'll also tell you about you know, as this course goes on. And basically what it's doing is it's sort of taking a model and it's asking it to fail to be falsified by a whole bunch of statistical tests that basically just measure the average outcomes over carefully designed subsets of the data and check that the model's predictions are consistent with those measured averages. Okay. But, you know, hey, like that doesn't mean these things are gonna uniquely specify the model. Remember, um, we can have these two different worlds, you know, where either it rains, you know, actually randomly, or it just rains deterministically on half of the days that are indistinguishable. So, so like this doesn't get around that problem, right? Like, so we might have two models that are both multi-calibrated with respect to the same set of reference classes that we've tried and failed to falsify on exactly the same subsets of the data. And yet like two, both of these models survive. Right, uh, but like they might disagree wildly on most individual probabilities like uh, okay now what do we do what justifies decision making that we make as a function of one of these models over the other. So we accuracy might be one thing right like true individual probabilities. Um, you know, if you if you had them in hand, and you then tried to evaluate how accurate your predictions were in terms of squared error well these would minimize squared error. Well, prove that maybe today um right so you know like suppose p hat or the so suppose p hat is the function you've learned that is your like um model of individual probabilities you can evaluate the expected squared error of this model sometimes called the briar score which is just um you know the expected value when you when i draw a new sample from the distribution of like the squared difference between my prediction and the actual outcome Okay, this is something that's just an average over data. So it's one of those things I can actually measure. And, um, you know, one thing that's true, we'll prove momentarily, is that um, if P are the true individual probabilities, then they've got smaller squared error than any other model. So if I've got two models and enough data to verify from data, that the Breyer score for the one model is less than the Breyer score for the other, that falsifies model two. Model two can't possibly be the, the true individual probabilities, right? Because uh, it you know, there's another model that has lower Breyer score. But like the model multiplicity problem arises when we've got two models that, you know, like are equally accurate. So we can't falsify either one this way. Maybe they're multi-calibrated with the same set of reference classes. We can't falsify them that way. And yet they make wildly different predictions on a lot of different people. Like now what do we do? What, like what privileges one of these over another? Maybe you don't have to worry about that too much if you're just making these predictions, but if you're taking actions, especially important actions as a basis, on the basis of these predictions, maybe you worry about stuff like this. Okay, so what are we gonna do in this class? 
Well, we're going to try to think about these problems through the lens of um, uncertainty quantification um, while making minimal assumptions, right? So if you've taken, you know, like a traditional statistics or econometrics class, maybe you've seen a way around a lot of these problems. Like, for example, I could just assume the world is linear, right? Like, <laughs> like if I just assume that, like, you know, y is theta dot x, then all of these problems go away. If the world is linear. I can just, you know, <laughs> infer the parameters. Um, and, you know, to the extent that I believe in the model, then, you know, I, I stop worrying about any of this. Um, we're going to think about things you can do if, if you're, if, if, you know, that doesn't let you sleep well at night. Um, and we know that, like, it's too much to hope for to learn correct models of individual probabilities. So that's not going to be our goal, but, you know, like, what we can hope to do is come up with increasingly stringent ways to falsify incorrect models. That's sort of going to be the, the premise uh, that we build on as, as this class goes on. Okay, so we're going to build up a hierarchy of conditions that correspond to increasingly demanding statistical tests aimed at falsifying the premise that something is a, is a correct model of individual probabilities, and we will become increasingly proud of ourselves as we are able to find models that pass these increasingly stringent tests. Okay, so if you've, if you've seen calibration, this is something that shows up sort of at a low level of this hierarchy. Um, and it's a, it's a computer science class. So, you know, we're going to be interested also in efficiency, by which I mean both computational and statistical efficiency. So, you know, in some sense, you, you can do all sorts of things in the limit as you get infinitely large amounts of data. We don't want to, we, we want to sort of think about things we can say, not just in like the finite sample regime, but like in the small sample regime or, you know, small for a computer scientist, which sometimes use big O notation. But, um, you know, we're going to be interested in, in proving things about our models, um, you know, concrete things when the amount of data we have is not unlimited. Okay. Um, we're also going to be interested in sort of, um, you know, when, I, when I say we want to do things under minimal assumptions. Okay, so, I, you know, we already talked about maybe middle, minimal modeling assumptions. I don't want to assume things about the world, like that, you know, the world is linear, for example. But I might not even want to assume even more basic things that, like, the data is drawn IID from some distribution. Right? That's a very convenient assumption, but it's often violated, right? Like, you know, if we go back to sort of our pandemic example, um, you know, as... Oops. I haven't posted too many embarrassing things while this was being just in my pockets. Um, you know, like, like as the pandemic moves through the population, right, the kinds of patients that come to our hospital might change in drastic and unexpected ways, right? Like maybe initially it's like, you know, wealthy travelers coming back from Europe, then it starts being essential workers, things like that violate. IID assumptions. Um, yeah, it's not just the distribution over, over features, it's the relationship between the features and the labels, right? Like as we come up with better treatments, the relationship between the features and the thing we're trying to predict might change, right? It also violates IID assumptions. And so in a lot of this literature on uncertainty estimation, you know, because it's so convenient, people assume that the data is IID or at least uh, exchangeable, which just means essentially that the observations are permutation invariant. Th these are assumptions that like roughly translate into the future should look like the past. But that's not off, like sometimes that's not the case. And so we're going to want to study what we can do when that's not the case as well. And here's a cartoon uh, sort of the punchline of which is that your, your Christmas uh, uh, gift desires are, are do not come from an exchangeable distribution. Okay, so um, 
you know, okay, we'll see maybe the order in which we teach these stuff, these things. I'm putting together a bunch of notes in sort of book book form that has this outline, but I don't know. I'm not I'm not committing to teaching them in exactly this order, but roughly things we're going to cover are going to be divided between sort of what I think of as like the mathematical foundations and then like applications of the techniques we build up. <laughs> so we're going to think about calibration, um, you know, and we'll say very precisely what that is, but you know, this maybe you've heard of, like it means basically if, if I'm talking about calibration for means, then it says, you know, when I predict that there's a 20% chance that it's going to rain tomorrow. Um, you know, if I average over the frequency of rain for all of those days for which I predicted 20%, it should be 20%, similarly 30%. So we're going to learn about calibration. And you can talk about calibration, it turns out, not just for means, but also for other statistics. We'll think about calibration for quantiles, which is going to be useful when we try to come up with prediction intervals. And then we're going to start to think about other things we can um, condition on. So maybe you know, like going back to our cartoon here. I'm interested in this patient who's a member of all of these different groups. So maybe I want to come up with sort of conditions on my model such that I can give meaningful uncertainty estimates conditioning on different groups, even when like they're not disjoint, even when there might be a single patient who's a member of all of them. So we're going to think about group conditional guarantees. And you can combine those with calibration, right? I could say, OK, not only do I want to condition on a group, I want to condition on predicting that you have a 20% chance of needing to be admitted to the ER tomorrow. And I want that for all of the patients for whom I predicted a 20% chance and, for, and who are in your demographic group, it should indeed be the, fact, it, it should indeed be the case that 20% of them need to be admitted to the hospital. Um, you know, we're going to start by doing this for IID data, but we're going to also try to do all of these things for data that might be chosen by an adversary for which we make no distributional assumptions at all. Okay, and we're going to want all of these guarantees to hold empirically on the transcript of observations that we make. Uh, we're going to think about more general statistical tests beyond these sorts of averages and what we can say about them. Okay, and then once we've learned all of this stuff, or maybe before, uh, we'll start to think about things we can do with it. So one is uh, we can give all sorts of different algorithms for what's called conformal prediction. These are sort of um, generic way, sort of a generic recipe for taking an arbitrary machine learning model or statistical model that we don't need to assume anything about. Um, and attaching to it sort of prediction sets of various sorts. So a prediction set, you know, if, if we're in a regression problem, a prediction set is just a prediction interval. But if we're in a classification problem, more generally, it's a set of labels. And the semantics we want to attach to those sets are that with some target confidence, like 90% of the time, the true label should fall in the set we predict. And ideally, that happens not just marginally over the distribution, but conditionally on all of these things we like to condition on. Um, we're going to think about it, these techniques give us some way to think about robustness to distribution shifts. But if we trained our model on some distribution, but then we go to deploy it and we find that the distribution that we're deploying it on is not the same that we trained it on, can we say anything at all about the accuracy of our model on this new distribution? Well, maybe there's some stuff we can say. We'll think about model ensembling, you know, suppose we find ourselves in this situation where we've got two models that seem to be like equally good, but they make different predictions. What do we do? Um, we'll think about downstream optimization, like these statistical estimators don't exist in a vacuum. We're using them for something. We're going to use them presumably to make some decisions downstream. Uh, and we'll think about what we can say about those decisions. And in particular, we'll, we'll find some applications to fairness in machine learning. Um, there's connections to game theory and mechanism design. We'll, we'll think about those. Uh, and and you know, we'll see. This might ad adapt as the course goes on. 
Okay, so like maybe some basic mechanics. Um, so most of you found your way here. That's good. We've got a course website, uh, uncertaintyclass.com. Check it out. Um, I'll try to post whatever are the like, you know, I don't know, artifacts we generate here. So we'll see after this class whether I'm in fact recording this lecture, but perhaps I am, and there's going to be a video if I am. Um, but uh, it doesn't mean you shouldn't come to the class. Um, there's going to be very careful lecture notes. Those will be also maybe on the website or, you know, uh, there's a there's a Slack for this class that if you were registered as of, I don't know, two days ago, you were invited to. Otherwise, you might not have been. But there's a link to the Slack channel on the website. So if you go to the website, join the Slack. Definitely, I'll post the lecture notes in the Slack. Uh, and, you know, when they reach a state of sufficient, they will, will be sufficiently unembarrassed. I'll post them on the website. Um, okay, and then, like, so yeah, so, so what do we do in this class? Well, you know, mostly I talk at you, but, um, you know, eventually you guys should produce something. My goal here is for this to, this class to sort of get you up to the research frontier on the set of topics that we're, that we're talking about. And so the main deliverable that you guys need to come up with by the end of this class is like a substantial research project, right? So, so think about, uh, um, think about this as sort of, you know, a relatively open-ended research project. I'll post some ideas and pointers on the website, but like, you know, the idea is for you to generate new knowledge and publish a paper, ideally. Like, I'm not going to fail you if you don't publish the paper by the end of the class, but that should be the goal that you set out with. Like, you know, hopefully there's stuff here that's sufficiently interesting to, to, to think about, and, and, you know, there's plenty of new stuff to do here. So, um, you know, there's basically no rules, like you, you don't have to do it on your own, like research is collaborative, work in groups, um, you know, and I guess I should enforce some kind of structure just so you don't all like wake up the day before the end of class and have to do something. So probably at some point I'll say, I want a project proposal by next week. Give me some ideas for what you're gonna do. Maybe at some point I'll say, I want an intermediate project report, some evidence that you're doing something. And then eventually I'll say, all right, let's see what you've done. Um, and, and you know, you'll turn in something that kind of looks like a paper and you'll stand up here and you'll tell us about it. Okay. And that's it. You know, there's not gonna be any problem sets. There's not gonna be any exams. Um, so this is, you know, um, oh, but, but like, you know, eventually you're going to have to like stand up here and like, you know, tell us what you've done, which if you haven't done anything is, is going to be extremely embarrassing for, for all of us. So, so, you know, there's not too many things along the way. So it would be easy to get like caught up, you know, tripped up by this, but like, you know, <laughs> don't think of this as like an invitation to not work very hard because, you know, like, uh yeah you have to stand up here and it's going to be recorded it's going to be online it's going to it's going to follow you around forever yeah exactly right like it, not, you can't delete anything from the internet so, so this is you know i i think of this as the main like carrot and stick here beyond the grade right <laughs> all right um questions about any of the like course mechanics uh, two questions. The first question is, uh, is the presentation within the like, uh, usual classes that happen later in the exam? I know it'll be, so we're, we, we don't have any, any exam, nothing during exam week, probably a couple of, you know, each of these class sessions is scheduled for three hours. I won't make you speak for three hours. We can probably fit, you know, multiple of them in per session. I'll probably allocate a few of these to the student presentations. Uh, Showed us the foundations among the applications. So, do you plan to like uh, go over the foundations entirely and then go to the applications, or do you want to? Yeah, we'll see how it goes. I don't know. But, you know, uh, we'll need to have the foundations that we're going to apply before we apply them. Um, if we are working in groups, are you expecting like a unified paper or a similar topic that we kind of discussed and then you write a template, separate template paper? Um, 
I would think the most natural thing if you're working in groups is to to write one paper. But you know, you can you can do what you want. But but it, it's not that it's not that everyone needs to like write a ten page paper. Like my goal here is to try to get you guys to produce new knowledge, not to you know like hit page limits. Is this like a weekly course? Or sorry, a yearly course, or is this like a one? -time? This is like a one off. Yeah. But we'll see. Maybe maybe like when I post these on YouTube or something, it'll really tick off. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, other other questions? Okay, um, so I'll I'll be working from lecture notes that I make, and the lecture notes will be available. Those will be so, oh, and I also have just a, a list of you know like interesting source papers on the on the website. Um, all right, uh, one more Dolly image. So now. See what time it is. I'll switch to the board. Actually, let's see. So at some point, you guys might want to use the bathroom. Let's let's maybe like pull the class now. If we're gonna have like a bathroom break, like a five minute bathroom break, would you want it to be now or would you want it to be sometime in the future? I, I see one vote for now. If you want the bathroom break now, raise your hand. <laughs> you can use. Oh, okay. Oh, oh, yeah. What if? What if? What if it was a break? I, I, I'm not going to police what you do during the break. <laughs> Why don't we take a five minute break, uh, reconvene here, and I'll start writing stuff on the board. Yeah. Uh, it's a little bit earlier today, but is that fine? And, sure. And uh, I'll Rolling the clock. What did he say? Can I order the clock? Sure. So I've got the canvas. There's no canvas, but uh, uh, you know, there's the course website and the Slack. You can join the Slack. I was like busy on the Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Great. Uh, I hope everyone enjoyed and made full use of their break. So, um, okay, so now I'm going to like dive into like basically boring preliminaries and, and just like continue. But like before I do that, are there any larger questions maybe about, I don't know, the premise of any of these things I claim to you over the first hour? Uh, or is everyone totally on board? We should just like dive into the math. All right. So, um, you know, let's let's think about some, you know, just like notation that we'll carry with us throughout the course. So, um, in general, we're going to think about predictions, like prediction tasks, over um, a domain, which I'm going to call Z, and Z is the Cartesian product of two things, X and Y. Okay, so think about X as being some abstract like feature space, right? I'm generally not gonna assume too much about it, but like, you know, if I'm if I'm making predictions based on some observable features or covariates, like those things live in X. And the things I'm trying to predict, the labels, those things live in Y. Okay. So it, you know, like possible values for Y. Uh, you know, could be you know that's like y is zero one. If we're if we're if we're trying to solve like a binary prediction problem, is it going to rain or not tomorrow? Then the label space is going to be binary. Uh, it could be that y is um, 
you know, the reals, if I'm solving a regression problem, the outcome might be real valued. It might be that y, um, you know, is just a subset of the reals, maybe like the unit interval between zero and one, if I'm trying to predict the probability. It could be that y is some discrete set. You know, like if I'm trying to solve like an image net problem, is this thing a pineapple or a, uh, what's a breed of dog? Chihuahua, pineapple or a chihuahua. Okay, so, you know, for a large part of the class, we're going to think about like the regression problem, predicting probabilities, but we'll get to all of these things, especially in the applications. And we're going to model the world generally, um, well, sometimes using a distribution. So, there's some distribution over this data domain, right? So I'll write that as, you know, this distribution lies in the simplex over this data domain. Okay, so, you know, when I wanna, in some, you know, if I, if I wanna like get my hands on a new data point, then I can like reach into this platonic ideal of the world modeled by the distribution and pull one out. Okay, I don't have, direct access to this thing, but like the distribution is the object that we're imagining exists that defines all of these probabilities that we might be trying to estimate. And, um, you know, notationally, I might sometimes be interested not in the whole distribution over labeled examples, but maybe just the distribution over feature vectors, right? So I might talk about the distribution on feature vectors, d sub x, this is just like the projection of the whole distribution onto just the feature vectors, right? Sometimes I don't see labels. Um, or sometimes, especially when I'm talking about individual probabilities, I might be interested in the conditional label distribution given some features. I'll write that as d sub y of x. This is just like the, you know, the distribution on labels for a particular feature vector for a particular person, say. Yeah. Now, um, you know, a model. Let's say you know we're we're in um, the setting where the labels are are numbers between zero and one. A model is nothing more than a function f that maps features to labels in this case uh you know maybe numbers between zero and one and and you know what like we could think of like a model like this makes sense both in like the regression problem when the actual labels can be real numbers between zero and one and in the binary classification problem say where the predictions are supposed to be probabilities the probability that the label is one, for example. Okay, so even when the even when the labels are binary, we, it might be sensible to think about regression models that are predicting probabilities. Okay, and like the the sort of ideal model, like the Bayes optimal model, the thing that we would really love to get our hands on if we could, but like unfortunately we often can't. Um, I'll write that as f star. So f star of x is just the expected value of the label drawn from the conditional label distribution given x. Okay, so like you know, we talked about individual probabilities, like if, if this is a weather forecasting task, weather forecasting task, we want to know is it going to rain or not tomorrow. Um, F star of X, where X is, you know, all the measurements we've made, today's meteorological conditions, is just the true probability that it's going to rain tomorrow, conditional on X, given everything we know. Okay, so we, you know, we've already given up on like figuring out F star of X, but like, you know, it might be nice to refer to it. That's like that's going to be our target in a lot of in a lot of cases. Okay, so um, you know we're we're gonna 
be dealing with models and we're going to be asking the question is my model any good and there are different ways to ask that question but one way that is going to be sort of um you know one way that is sort of interesting in its own right but is also going to be like a technical tool that we use quite a lot is to evaluate the squared error of the model which is also called the Breyer score so um Let's call this squared error, but I'll write it with a B. B stands for Breyer score. Um, squared error of a model F on a distribution D. is just, well, I'll write it as B for Breyer score of F and D. And it is just the expectation of a sample drawn from the distribution D of the squared difference between the prediction of the model F of X and the actual outcome, y. Okay, so probably many of you are familiar with this function. Like if you're solving like a least squares linear regression problem, for example, you are taking you know, your data and you are trying to find, say, the linear model that minimizes this objective. Okay. Okay. Now, so far, um, you know, I, I've talked about like this ethereal distribution, but like, okay, we, we don't actually have direct access to the distribution. So where are our samples, you know, where, where are our samples actually coming from? And in this class, we're gonna think of sort of two settings, which I'll call like the batch prediction setting and the sequential prediction setting. Okay. So the batch prediction setting is probably um, the setting you're most familiar with. Okay, so um, in the batch setting, we're going to imagine that we, we have this distribution we've been talking about, and we can't access it directly, but what we can do is we can take samples from it. So we're going to have like a data set that consists of n samples drawn iid from this underlying distribution. All right, so in the batch setting, we imagine that we've got a data set D that you can distinguish from a distribution because it's less squiggly. And you know, D is just um, a collection of n records from our data domain. And I'll write D uh, sampled from the distribution raised to the nth power to denote that you know, I'll generally assume that the data set. Um, consists of n points, each of which were sampled independently from this data set. Okay, so I might use this notation again in the future. Okay. Um, so, you know, like in general, right, like we don't have access to the distribution in the batch setting, we have this data set, we're gonna do stuff with the data set and then hope that the results that we well, not just hope, but like prove that the results that we get like carry over to the underlying distribution. And oftentimes the way we're going to think about that notationally is we will think about the data set as inducing a different distribution, the empirical distribution on the n data points it contains. Okay, so we will we will abuse notation. and view D as a discrete distribution um, 
that puts weight one over n on each data point it contains. And so um, I will be allowed to write things as follows, like even though I've defined the squared error or the Breyer score as a quantity that is defined uh, on a distribution, it will be kosher in this course for me to write the Breyer score of F evaluated on a data set. Here I'm just treating the data set as if it were a distribution. It is a distribution. It's the uniform distribution on the points it contains. And what it is is just, well, the average over all of the points of their squared error. Okay, so I, I note this just because like going forward, you know, when we talk about like algorithms and stuff, um, I'll, I'll generally write everything as if there's some distribution that we have sort of direct access to, you know, things like the ability to compute expectations over that distribution and the premise is not that we have direct access to the you know distribution governing the world the thing we really care about uh, but that you know we will eventually run these algorithms on the distribution induced by a data set and then we will need to connect their performance on the data set to the performance on the distribution from which the data set was drawn okay so that's the batch setting Yeah, it is. And maybe if I wrote S instead of D, it would be, I'd have to keep less track of the squiggles, but uh, yeah, D for data sets rather than S for sample. Same thing. Okay. So that's the batch setting. Uh, we will not only think about the batch setting, we will also think about the sequential setting. The sequential setting will be sort of more difficult than the batch setting, uh, and we won't necessarily assume that there is a distribution, and we won't assume that we have access to the data that we're going to operate on ahead of time, right? In the in the sequential setting, you know, every day someone walks into our hospital, we don't have the luxury of having a, you know, training set of points that look exactly like them to train off of. We have to make predictions, take action as they walk in, and there's no presumption that the person who walks in tomorrow is going to look anything like the person who walked in yesterday. So in the sequential setting, um, there's a notion of time or, or rounds. So we'll, we'll imagine that time proceeds in rounds, which I'll index by T, and maybe fixing some notation you know, little t is going to index a particular round and capital T is like the, you know, the total length of the interaction, the, the index of the last round. And at each time step t, an adversary, which if you're a computer scientist sounds very natural and if maybe if you're like a biostatistician sounds weird, but you know, an adversary um, chooses maybe a, you know, a distribution over feature vectors xt and labels yt. And the learner observes xt, but importantly, not yt. Okay, so the learner wakes up on day t, they see the feature vector that the adversary chose that day, but they do not know the label. Now it's the learner's turn. The learner must make some prediction.
ET. And the form of that prediction can vary in the context. So it might be, you know, like just a number. Um, it might be a, you know, a, a set of labels. They make some prediction and, you know, there's various things in this class we will want these predictions to do in the aggregate, but for now, let's just leave it abstract. They make a prediction. And only after uh, they make a prediction do they learn the label. They learn if they were right or not. Okay. Um, now, typically, you know, the adversary is potentially an active player in this interaction, right? The adversary might look at the prediction made by the learner and think about what they want to do with the next round, right? That like, you know, this is the sense in which we're not assuming any fixed distribution. The distribution uh, chosen by the adversary at every round can be different and it can be a function of everything that happened in the past. Okay, in particular, like it might be that whatever the learner's goal is, like to make calibrated predictions in a regression setting, again, if you don't know what that means, you soon will, uh, that, the, that the adversary's, you know, only goal might be to like stop that from happening. Okay, so this is like a very um, demanding model. Um, and, you know, like, what does it even mean to like evaluate things in such a model? There's no, there's no distribution here. Everything's going to be evaluated empirically, right? It's like, we'll look at and see what happens. So an interaction for which this is the template for, an interaction um, generates a transcript. IT, which is just a recording of everything that happened. So for each round T, for each round little t, it records the feature vector, the prediction, and the actual realized label. Okay, so this interaction proceeds over T rounds. After the interaction completes, now we can look back and see what the transcript is. And in particular, this induces some empirical distribution. Now we've got you know, feature label pairs together with predictions. And we can look on this empirical distribution, was it the case that the, um, that the learner's predictions looked reasonable? Did they, you know, you know, did they look like they were calibrated? Did the prediction sets cover their label with the target probability? Things like that. And in general, the kind of thing we will try to do in this setting is come up with algorithms that can produce transcripts that are guaranteed to look reasonable in the worst case, no matter what the adversary is doing. Right, and if, if you're from theoretical computer science, this is probably a very natural model. Like, of course, there's an adversary. If you're from a different field, you might think, you know, what the heck? Like, what are we, you know, are we hypothesizing that like, you know, our, our computer scientists all like, you know, paranoids who think that, you know, we, we shouldn't be thinking about like physics and statistics, but like there's someone out to get us. Um, the, I think the answer to that is no. The reason to think about very demanding models like this in which examples might come even from, a, from an adversary is that when we make strong assumptions, for example, that the data is drawn IID or that it's exchangeable or that the world is linear. Um, we have to worry that our assumptions are not satisfied, that if the world is not linear or if the distribution shifts in some unexpected way, that these claims that we think we're making that we hope are true, but are really only true conditional on our assumptions being true, um, like they won't hold anymore. And so to the extent that we can make that we can give methods that give guarantees without making hardly any assumptions at all, right? We can sleep easier at night because the fewer assumptions we have made, the fewer opportunities there are for those assumptions to fail to hold. And so the, the reason 
to think about sort of an adversarial setting is not because we think there's an adversary out there, but because you know maybe um, we don't have the hubris to think that we understand how the world works and we just don't want to make assumptions that might turn out to be wrong. And this is sort of a, a setting in which there's really minimal assumptions about what the data looks like. So it's a, um, it's a demanding setting because it's making very few assumptions, but to the extent that we can actually like get positive results in this setting, uh, they're very they're very robust. Right? And yeah, we'll be able to get some. Okay, so questions about like the notation and you know like the sort of model we've set up here. Okay, so. Um, Remember that we sort of set up the premise for what we're gonna do in this course um, as introducing like a hierarchy of ever more demanding statistical tests aimed at falsifying that a model that purports to really know what's going on, that purports to know the underlying probabilistic structure of the world um, really does. So we're gonna, we're gonna try to like, come up with tests that that might call out that lie that might falsify models as incorrect and we're going to start with tests that are really easy to pass like uh, uh, unreasonably simple tests but then we'll build up from there um oh, and the idea is that you know maybe we get something that you know looks more and more like the truth the more you know tests we can pile upon tests um, or at least something that you cannot distinguish from the truth, because, you know, maybe if you had a way of reliably distinguishing our predictions from the truth, that could form a test that you could add on. Um, you know, and eventually maybe we argue that if you can't distinguish something from the truth, then, you know, maybe it's good enough for all intents and purposes. Yeah. Oh yeah, so you know, there's other loss functions you might care about. I'm not writing this one down because I'm making like a normative judgment. This is like the loss function, but it happens that for a lot of what we do, this is gonna be a very useful technical tool. So for a lot of what we do, we're gonna be analyzing algorithms by arguing that there's some potential function that decreases at every step. And quite often this is the potential function. So, you know, I'm not making value judgments. I'm introducing uh, things only insofar as they're going to be useful to me. But this is not the only one we're going to deal with. Okay. So let's let's maybe start uh, down this path of thinking of like really simple tests that uh, would be passed by like the true probabilities. Um, and are possible to fail, but otherwise are not like super demanding. Um, and the first set of tests I want to think about are just tests that check for marginal consistency. Okay, like on average, the model should be right. Like if I, you know, average over the predictions of the model and I average over the labels, those things should match up like the true probabilities would satisfy that it is possible to not satisfy that and there's probably something wrong with your model if, if your model doesn't satisfy that okay um so i'm mostly setting this up sort of as a straw man to well both introduce some of the kinds of analyses we're going to do but also motivate the need for stronger guarantees but like I will point out that there are whole fields like um, much of conformal prediction as it stands that are, you know, that, that primarily get by on marginal guarantees. Okay. So let's talk about means first, and maybe we'll get to quantiles as well. 
let's say that a model is, remember, a function from the features to let's restrict attention at the moment to models that predict numbers between zero and one. So think about these as either regression functions in a setting where the labels are numbers between zero and one, or regression functions that are predicting the probability maybe of a binary outcome. Let's say that such a model um, has marginal mean consistency error alpha if when I look at the expected value of the prediction of the model. Okay, so I just like look at on average, what does the model predict when I sample a random feature vector from the distribution? And I compare that to the actual average value of a label when I sample a labeled example from the distribution. If these two numbers differ by alpha, and if alpha is zero, I'll say that F satisfies marginal mean consistency. Okay, so like, let's think about this as like a simple sanity check, right? Like suppose my model actually encoded the true individual probabilities. Well, like one way I could, in that case, sample a label from the underlying distribution is first, I could sample um, a random feature vector from the distribution. And then I could sample a label from the conditional label distribution given the feature vector. And the average value of the label, if F was the actual you know, conditional label expectation given the feature vector would be, would be this, right? This would exactly equal the um, expected value of the label if F uh, encoded true individual probabilities. So if F was equal to F star, it would, it would satisfy marginal mean consistency. And to the extent that F is not equal to, or to the extent that my model does not satisfy marginal mean consistency, that is a falsification that my model encodes the correct probabilities. Like it should at least, you know, but like this is like if on average, you know, my local weather station says that like there's an 80% chance of rain, you know, like that's their average prediction. And yet it only rains 20% of the time in Philadelphia, then like clearly there's something wrong with the weatherman, right? So this is not a very, like, like if, you, if you satisfy marginal mean consistency, that doesn't say much, you know, that, that's not saying much about your model. That's not like a huge win, but like if you don't satisfy marginal mean consistency, there's definitely something wrong, right? And in particular, the, you know, as we like, you know, maybe like as we start introducing later in the class, more and more stringent conditions, the thing I'm always gonna want from the conditions that I introduce is that they should be satisfied by the true conditional label, uh, expectations. They should be satisfied by F star, right? So like the truth should pass these tests and that is true of this condition. When you're saying this is a stringent, um, you mean redefining what X means, what features mean. So one way to define features is it will rain within the limits of the city of Philadelphia. So maybe another way is like, it will rain within the limits of West Philly. And another yet is it will rain in this specific block. Yeah, so, so, so like, I, uh, let's see. So first of all, I don't wanna quibble too much about like the specifics of weather prediction. So, but, but I think what you're getting at is like the definition of the label. Yeah. Like, what does it mean it rain? Yeah. And I'm just gonna, I, you know, in these discussions, when I bring up weather prediction, I'm gonna assume 
that there's some well-defined measure for the label. Did a single drop of rain land within the you know city limits of Philadelphia within you know, between like midnight you know last night and midnight tonight for, for example right so the you know like that's a what you're describing now is a sort of a what is modeled here as a property of the distribution like of course we need to in order to sample from the distribution we need a precise definition for what y means what y equals one means that's baked into the distribution when I talk about you know the distribution could be anything right so it could it could be whatever it could be defined by whatever your favorite definition of it rained is when I talk about increasingly stringent conditions I'm not talking about designing anything into the distribution I'm talking about asking for things stronger than just you know that is right on average does that make sense we could we could look at more complicated things okay good question other questions Okay. So, I mean, one, yeah, marginal mean consistency is super weak, but like one nice property about it is it's defined uh, only through unconditional expectations, which means we can like measure it very easily. Right? And we'll talk more about, you know, how we can take measurements from data and translate them into guarantees on the distribution, but like, you know, unconditional expectations are the kinds of things we can estimate very accurately. Question? Wouldn't it make more sense to define it as less than alpha? You could. I'm going to, it's going to be useful for me to define it this way, but, you know, it, it, there might be situations in which it is sensible for you to utter the sentence, my oh. predictor has marginal mean consistency error at most alpha. But sometimes it's going to be useful for me to know like what alpha is. Um, other questions? Okay, so the nice thing, right, you know, is, is that like this is something we can easily check. We can easily measure this from data. And as a result, it's also like easy to fix, right? Like if our model does not satisfy marginal mean consistency, then we can fix it. So let's say that, you know, suppose our model does not satisfy marginal mean consistency. Well, how should we fix it? Well, let me define delta to be just the difference between the expected value of the label and the expected value um of the prediction okay the fact that our model does not satisfy marginal mean consistency means that um this delta is not zero okay it's going to be you know like plus or minus alpha um and uh let's just say well f hat f hat of x this new model i'm going to think about it's just f of x plus delta Okay, so maybe I've got this model F doesn't satisfy marginal mean consistency. I just measure this thing delta, pretty easy to measure from data. For now, let's just say I have it exactly. We'll talk about measuring it from data in a moment. Um, and I just gonna, I'm gonna come up with this new model by just like shifting my existing model by a constant. I'm just gonna like shift it up or down by, by this quantity delta. Okay, so one, you know, immediately obvious thing is that my new model f hat of x um, satisfies marginal mean consistency right and, and that's just sort of by construction if I look at what is the expected value of f hat of x, 
Well, by definition, it's the expected value of f of x plus delta, because f hat of x just takes f of x and adds delta. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's okay. Mm. Yeah, so, so like marginal mean, you know, like maybe you're getting at a good point about marginal mean consistency, even if. I know that the labels are between like zero and one. Maybe the labels are binary, right? So f of x purports to be a probability. You can satisfy marginal mean consistency while being like just clearly wrong, right? Like you can predict probabilities that are bigger than one. You can predict negative probabilities and still you can satisfy marginal mean consistency, right? Which is just asking about the average of your predictions. So like, it, it should be clear that like, you know, you can go, you, you know, if we're trying to like falsify that something is a correct model of the world, you can go well beyond marginal mean consistency. Um, but what I want to observe here is that satisfying marginal mean consistency is like super easy. And you're right, it might, you know, if I do nothing other than this, maybe I'm going to sometimes predict negative probabilities or probabilities greater than one. Doesn't matter if this is our only goal. Make sense? Okay, so just, you know, like verifying this, right? Like f hat of x, well, it's just f of x shifted by this constant delta. So the expectation of f hat of x is just the expectation of f of x plus delta. But what's delta? Well, it's just the expectation of f of x um, plus, well, delta, which is the expectation of y minus the expectation of f of x. And so the expectation of f of x cancels, and this is just the expectation of y. Okay, so like by construction, um, when we when we just shift f by by delta, the degree, you know, exactly the degree to which the labels were um, different on average from the predictions, then our new model satisfies marginal mean consistency, right? The problem was that the model was systematically shifted by delta, we just shifted it back. All right, that might not have been the only problem with the model, but that was the problem that's like marginal mean consistency picked up on. Okay, so that's sort of obvious. Um, one thing that is maybe a little bit less obvious, um, but that will be important for us as we start coming up with like, more complicated ways to fix models is that f hat of x, right? Like, like suppose f of x um, really didn't satisfy marginal mean consistency. It had like marginal mean consistency error alpha for some large value of alpha. Well, then f hat of x will be substantially more accurate than f of x as measured by squared error. Okay, so like, you know, if the thing you cared about, for example, was squared error, you know, there's no reason to do this. Like, it's not that you're like getting something else by failing to satisfy marginal mean consistency. Like this like simple fix here, not just like causes the model to pass this one sanity check, but it actually makes the model just like strictly more accurate as measured by squared error. So like, there's, there's no reason not to perform this, this, uh, this little like fix, right? Like it's not just that we are disturbed by this evidence that the model is, uh, you know, like can't be correct. It's that um, this is, you know, if we don't if we don't shift things down to to make it match the mean on average, we're like leaving accuracy on the table. Okay. So what's the claim? And I'm going to work this out in some detail here because this is sort of going to be as I just foreshadowing a bit, um, you know, when we get to sort of more complicated algorithms that are aiming to produce predictors that satisfy more complicated sort of notions of correctness, um, 
the way we analyze them is often going to be to use something like squared error or something else as a potential function that show that as we manipulate our predictor, something is moving, you know, marching monotonically towards truth. And that's why it can't go on forever. We don't get into cycles. And what's going to, uh, like, the form of many of these algorithms is that we will change portions of the model to update, uh, to, to cause them to sort of be consistent with the data on average. And it's going to be important that those updates improve squared error. That's, you know, here it's just nice. Like, you know, we get, you know, like you make your model more accurate. But like later in the course, this is going to be key to how we analyze our algorithms. And in particular, make sure that they don't like run forever. Okay, so what's the claim? Fix any distribution D. Any model F. And let delta be defined as before. Delta is just um, the difference between the expected value of the label and the expected prediction of the model. Okay. And let f hat of x be defined as before. Let f hat of x be the model uh, that is just f of x plus delta. Okay. This like patched up model to satisfy marginal mean consistency. Then the squared error of f hat evaluated on d. It's going to be exactly the squared error of f evaluated on d minus delta squared. Okay, so if you have a big sort of marginal mean consistency gap delta, then you'll get a big improvement in accuracy as measured by squared error. And this connection is actually tight. This is not an inequality, right? If I get marginal mean consistency by shifting my model by delta, I will improve my squared error by exactly delta squared. Okay. So let's prove it. It's just a calculation, but I think an enlightening one, one that we'll, we're going we're gonna to use this kind of argument throughout the class. So let's do it carefully the first time. Okay, so we're interested in the change in squared error, the change in Breyer score. When we compare F, which is supposed to have the larger squared error, F was the original model that wasn't mean consistent, and F hat, this model that we've patched up. Yeah. Now, why don't we just expand out the definition of squared error? It's just the expectation over a draw from the data distribution. Well, by definition of the squared error of f minus the squared error of f hat. Okay, so it's the difference between the squared error of f, f of x minus y squared and the squared error of f hat, f hat of x minus y squared. Okay. Well, you know, let's just do it. We can expand out those squares. So this is f of x squared 
minus two f of x y plus y squared minus f hat of x squared, I guess, plus two f hat of x y minus y squared. Okay. And already we've gotten a cancellation, right? This y squared over here cancels out to this minus y squared over here. So let's tarry ho. So we'll cancel out those y's. And then, you know, like we know what f hat of x is, it's just f of x plus delta. So let's expand that out. Okay, so this is just the expectation of f of x squared minus 2 f of x y. The y squared is gone. Okay, minus f hat of x squared. That's just f of x plus delta squared plus 2 f hat of xy, that's just 2 f of x plus delta y, and our minus y squared is gone. Okay, now let's see. I guess we've got the opportunity to cancel more stuff, right? Because We've got this f of x squared here, but we're going to, yeah. oh yeah, we've got one there too. So, and they've got opposite signs. So that's nice. They're going to cancel out. Um, so what do we have left? Well, this f of x squared is going to cancel with this f of x squared. So we've got, um, oh, and we've got a two f of x y over here. Uh, and we've got a minus 2f of xy over here. So this cancels out as well. Um, OK, so now we're going to start to collect some terms here that, that haven't yet canceled out. So we've got, I guess, uh, minus 2 delta times f of x. So we've got minus 2 delta f of x. And we've got a minus delta squared. And we've already canceled out our two f of x y, but we've got a two delta y left over here. We've got a two delta y left over here. Okay. And now all of these terms have a delta in them. That's just a constant. So we can like factor that out of the expectation. So let's pull that delta out. Uh, in fact, hmm. Yeah, in fact, this term has a two delta and this term has a two delta. So let's pull out a two delta. And this term's a, this term's a um, delta squared, so it's like a constant. It doesn't need to be inside the expectation. So we've got two delta times the expectation of y minus f of x. minus delta squared. Right, delta squared is a constant. doesn't need to be inside the expectation. And what is the expectation of y minus f of x? Delta. So this thing's just delta. So we've got 2 delta squared minus delta squared, which is delta squared as promised. Okay. So this is uh, exact, right? Like we didn't, there were, there were no inequalities here anywhere, right? Like if we are keeping track of things with Breyer score, then when we fix one of these marginal mean consistency errors, we have like an exact handle on how we are changing the Breyer score. We're not approximating anything. It's not, you know, it hasn't gone down by at least delta squared. It has gone down by exactly delta squared. Okay, so like, you know, maybe, you know, what, what is the lesson from this? Well, maybe like in the, you know, myopically, right? Like, you know, if you care about squared error because you think, 
it's just a measure of accuracy. Like that was your objective when you were solving a regression problem or something. Then what this is saying is, you know, that like there's there's no excuse for failing to satisfy like marginal mean consistency. You, you weren't able to like it wasn't like it wasn't like a bias variance trade off or something that could like get you like lower squared error at the you know expense of not you know being you know an unbiased estimator or something. It's like this was like purely like a mistake, like accuracy left on the table. If you if you find a problem like this, you should fix it, and you know you'll you'll reap the rewards in your objective function. That is not generally how we're going to use this, though. Um, like, like our, like we're not committing to caring about squared error preferentially over any other objective function. But squared error is going to be quite a useful function for us to think about because of exactly this property. And maybe just foreshadowing a little bit, right? Like what's happening here? We're finding a problem with the model um, marginally, like a problem with the model averaged over everything. And we're fixing it like over everything. We're shifting the whole model up and we're witnessing a decrease in squared error. The more sophisticated asks we are going to have of our model will often be decomposable. Um, this, this includes calibration, will be decomposable into a bunch of requests of the model, each of which has the form that over some subset of the data, the average prediction of the model should be equal to the average value of the label and the way our algorithms are going to you know march forward is in the obvious way by whenever it finds such a problem it will it will fix it by shifting not the whole model but the portion of the model uh, that speaks to the subset of the data that we're interested in and what's going to be important to us about this calculation uh, and similar ones is that we will make progress, monotonic progress on this squared error metric, which is not good in and of itself. It's not because we like care about squared error specifically. It is because squared error, you know, can only get so big and can only get so small. And so we can't make monotone progress on it for very many steps. So this is going to be key to lots of the things that we do. Now planning a little bit. I could tell you about quantiles now, but I think that that might take more time than we want to spend. So rather than telling you about quantiles now, let me keep talking about means and just talk about what you might do if you don't have the actual distribution at your disposal. So you can't actually compute this thing because what is this distribution? You only have data. Yeah, I didn't have much way to do it, but it's a lot of It's a lot of the thing. It seems like you're kind of looking at all these versions of, or oh, one of the main versions of the squared error system that is going to be the new computation for it, uh, or algorithm, right? Well, well, there's lots of nice things about squared error, um, but. The way I'm going to use it is often as a potential function, which is sort of part of the analysis of an algorithm. Now, if you've got like a statistics background and you know you're into the ordinary least squares model, you know the reason you minimize squared errors, you know, because it gives you like the maximum likelihood estimate. Um, so, like, there's other reasons to like squared error. Um, you know, it's a proper scoring rule, so it's you know minimized by predicting the mean of a distribution, which is related to this computation. Uh, you know, there's lots of nice things about squared error and different people like it for different reasons. So I didn't mean to like besmirch squared error. I just mean that um, like the reason maybe to pay attention to this calculation is not only to say that if you are someone who cares deeply about squared error that you should fix any marginal mean consistency errors that you find, but also that this will be useful for us like instrumentally in analyzing algorithms going forward. Okay, good. All right, so let me tell you one more thing before we wrap up today. Um, it's, you know, it'll be a simple thing to introduce you to sort of a, a workhorse statistical tool that we're gonna use throughout the class. So, you know, I said, okay, you know, 
easy to fix a model if it doesn't satisfy marginal mean consistency. Just compute this number delta. It's like, you know, the difference between the expectation of y and the expectation of f of x. And shift your model up by delta. But okay, how do you compute this thing, right? Like you don't have you don't have like access to the distribution. What we have in the batch model is a sample, right? So like, presumably, what you would do is you would say, okay, well, I'm going to compute like the empirical value of delta from my sample, just the value of delta that comes from treating the uniform distribution over my data set as if it were the distribution. And I'm going to fix my model um, by, by adding, you know, this empirical estimate of delta. And, and so like the question is, is that any good? But like, you know, does that have any relationship to the real value of delta on the underlying distribution? And if it does, how, close is that relationship as a function of how many samples that you that, that you have you know more samples are better but like how much better and so let's say something about that and again this will be sort of a very easy case but think about this as like you know the easy case of a of a more general pattern that we will see in this class where we sort of you know fix yeah show how to like fix a model up to satisfy some nice statistical property assuming that you have access to the distribution, then saying, well, the distribution you're going to run it on is probably just the empirical distribution of data, and then asking the question, well, how, you know, what, what does that tell me about how good the model is on the underlying distribution from which the data was drawn? Okay. Okay, fix any model S. And distribution D. And let D without the squiggle be a sample of endpoints drawn IID from D with the squiggle. Okay. And, and the order of the quantifiers is important here. The model is fixed and then the data is drawn. The thing I'm going to say is not going to be true if you chose the model from this data. Okay. Fix the model, draw the data. Okay. Let's let Delta be the quantity we've been talking about, be such that f hat of x defined to be f of x plus delta satisfies marginal mean consistency. not on squiggly D, not on the underlying distribution, but on regular D, the data set. Maybe there was something to this calling it S. Okay. Then the claim is with probability one minus delta, this is probability over the randomness of the selection of the data set. That's the only source of randomness here, the selection of the data set from the underlying distribution. F hat has marginal mean consistency error. At most alpha 
on the underlying distribution for alpha no larger than the square root of two log of two over delta, the high probability parameter divided by n, the number of samples I've got. Okay, so the claim is that if I satisfy marginal mean consistency on my sample, then I'll satisfy uh, maybe not perfect marginal mean consistency, but approximate marginal mean consistency on the distribution where the approximation term goes to zero at a rate of one over root n. Okay, so if I have on the order of one over epsilon squared many samples, then I can achieve marginal mean consistency error epsilon on the distribution. Okay. All right. So by the end of the class, this kind of thing will be bread and butter for you if you're a theoretical computer science student. So it already is, but um, let me just go through it in detail uh, for, for those of you who haven't seen quantitative claims like this, because we're going to, it is a basic but important tool that we're going to use over and over again called Huffing's inequality. Okay. So let me just quote for you Huffing's inequality. Let x1 through xn be independent random variables bounded such that xi is always between AI and BI. Okay, so X1 through XN don't have to be distributed the same way. They can have different bounds, but they are independent of one another. Let's let SN denote their sum. SM is just, SN is just the sum from I equals one to N of XI. Then the claim is for all t, all numbers t bigger than zero, the probability that the realized value of the sum of these random variables differs from its expectation. By more than t, is at most two times e to the minus two t squared over the sum from i equals one to n of the range of xi squared. Okay, so this is like a quantitative version of the law of large numbers. It says if you take like an empirical average well, you know, it's like immediate that it's expectation, you know, that it's like unbiased, but not only is it unbiased, it is extremely unlikely with, you know, there's a high probability bound for whatever, um, you know, the value of the right-hand side that you choose to select that it will not, you know, that the realized sum of these random variables will not differ from their expectation by too much or, you know, said another way, the realization of a sum concentrates around its expectation when the elements of that sum are independent random variables that are that are bounded. Okay, so this, uh, you know, this is going to be useful over and over again in this class. So, you know, you will eventually have it memorized, but here it is. Okay, so how do we apply it? So this is, this is just sort of a a statement of Huffing's inequality.
Okay, so in our case, what is delta? Right, delta was this quantity we computed on our empirical sample. So delta was a sum of some sort over the endpoints that we had in our sample. Right, delta was one over n times the sum over all of the points x, y in our data set of y minus f of x. Right, this is just the expectation uh, of y minus the expectation of f of x, where we're taking the expectation over the empirical distribution. Okay, and the expectation over the empirical distribution is a sum, and the points x, y in our data set are drawn independently. That was the assumption we made. And so, um, you know, if we think of each of these terms as one of the xi's that we're summing up, we're satisfying the hypothesis of Huffington's inequality that they are, that they're sampled independently of one another. They're also bounded, right? Each term in this sum, I can think of as y minus f of x divided by n, bringing the one over n inside. Each term in the sum is, well, if y and f of x are numbers between zero and one, less than one over n and greater than minus one over n. So the, the, so the range of these random variables is two over n, not more than two over n. And so, Binary f it doesn't have to be binary, but for the for the boundedness, um, the premise here is that it's uh, bounded between zero and one. Um, f plus delta doesn't have to be, but uh, f does. And that's necessary. Like if, um, like if f is like completely unbounded, then you're not even like, you know, even just the problem of figuring out what is the expectation of f is going to be something that you can't necessarily do from finite data, right? Like it, if if f has takes if f of x is a million with probability one over a million and zero otherwise, then the expectation of f of x is one but I'm gonna think the expectation is zero until I've taken around a million samples. So, so this is a like, so it's a good point. Like we do need F to be bounded uh, and it's not just like a technical assumption, like even just to like check whether you satisfy marginal mean consistency, like you have to estimate the expected value of F and if F is not bounded, you cannot do that. Make sense? Okay. Okay, so we satisfy the uh, hypotheses of, of Huffington's inequality, and so we can apply it. And what we get is that, oh, and one more, I guess, right? Like, what is the expectation of delta? Well, the expectation of delta is just. the expectation of y minus f of x because delta is just the sum of independent terms each of which are taking value y minus f of x the average of them okay so with all of the hypotheses of Huffington's inequality like checked off we can just turn the crank and what we find is that the probability that delta deviates from its expectation, which is just the expectation of y minus f of x by more than t is at most two 
e to the, well, what's this thing down here? Each of these terms takes value uh, two over n, right? Uh, so the square of them is like, I guess, four over n squared, but we're summing over n of them. So we get like four over n. Okay, so the denominator here is like four over n. So we get like minus two, um, no, minus n t squared over two. Now, we want, to, our, our theorem speaks to something that should happen with probability one minus delta. So we wanna see, okay, you know, what is the smallest value of T such that the probability that delta differs from its expectation by more than T is less than delta. So how do we find that value of T? we pick the value of t that makes the right-hand side of this bound equal to delta, okay? So we can solve for t by just setting the right-hand side of this bound to be equal to delta. And what we get is that the probability that delta differs from its expectation by more than the square root of two log two over delta over n is less than delta. This expression is just chosen so that when you substitute it in for t, this evaluates to delta. Okay, so finally. What is the marginal mean consistency error of f hat on the underlying distribution. It is by definition, the absolute value of the expectation over points drawn from the real squiggly distribution of the difference between the prediction f hat of x and the true label. which is just the absolute value of the expectation of points drawn from the squiggly distribution. Well, f hat of x is just f of x plus delta. So the expectation of the difference between f of x plus delta minus y. which is just the absolute value of delta minus the expectation of y minus f of x. And that's exactly what we bounded with Huffington's inequality. So with probability one minus delta, it's at most two log two over delta over n. So um, what have we established? If your model doesn't satisfy this weak condition of marginal mean consistency, then you can improve your model by fixing it. It's easy to fix it. You just have to shift it by a constant. The constant is the difference between two expectations that you can estimate easily from data. You don't even need that much data. If you sort of have n data points, then if you do everything on the data, you can expect that you are improving things on the distribution up to error sort of that's on the order of one over root n. Okay. Next class. Um, okay, so, so this, this was, this plays uh, sort of, you know, builds out some of the machinery we're gonna use when we talk about means. Both machinery we're gonna use for reasoning about how changes to models um, change the, um, I'll change the 
um, squared error of the model and also machinery that we're going to use to think about how estimates of things relating to means on data connect to their true values on on um, on the distribution. Means are not going to be the only thing we're interested in in this class. And so next class, I want to go through a similar set of calculations, not for means, but for quantiles. Right? If what we're interested in are prediction intervals or prediction sets, for example, what we're often interested in is not the mean of the distribution, but say the 90th percentile of the distribution. And what we are going to need is something like in particular, what we're going to need is something that's going to play the role of squared error here. That's going to show us that we make steady improvement on some metric when we patch up models to be consistent with quantiles. It's not going to be squared error, but there's another there's another function that'll play a similar role. We'll go through sort of a parallel set of derivations next time. There's also a parallel sort of derivation to sort of show that estimations of quantiles on your data are close to true quantiles on the distribution. And then I think we'll also uh, get to start talking about sequential prediction. All right. So let me now set the precedent of giving you back uh, some of your some of your time. Um, but I'll I'll stick around uh, if there's any if there's any questions. Um, one thing that I've been thinking about is uncertainty when, as opposed to observing a sample, I observe the whole population. So let's say that I, I don't know, I'm Social Security and I observe the totality of people who retire in the United States. And then I want to think about uh, uncertainty in terms of how many people are going to retire 